In this video, we'll be going over the basic concepts that go along with covalent bonding, when atoms share electrons to link together, forming compounds. We'll begin with a brief overview of some of the material we'll be covering. Uh, we'll first talk about why atoms form bonds in the first place. This discussion is exactly the same when talking about ionic or covalent bonding, but I think it's important to establish that basis uh, for why bonding occurs. We'll then come up with a definition for what a covalent bond is. Uh, this information will be largely reviewed from stuff you've seen in previous years. Next, we'll talk about some of the characteristics that go along with covalent bonding, mainly around the idea of bond strength, or how strong or difficult to break the bond is. Uh, bond strength can be determined like the type of bond we're dealing with, either a single, double, or triple bond, as well as the length of the bond. And we'll go over descriptions of both of those. Last but not least, we'll wrap up with a list of properties that most covalent compounds tend to have, although we will provide some examples of scenarios where properties can vary a little bit from the list that we'll create. Before we get started, you'll notice the picture over to the right. Uh, this is a very complicated uh, com covalent molecule uh, known as hemoglobin, something you guys have seen in the past or heard about in your bio classes. Uh, this is an example of where this topic eventually is going to take us. And we can see that in this very complex um, configuration here, in this very complex structure, uh, are all the basic ideas of what we're about to talk about today, as well as some of the material we'll talk about later on in the chapter uh, associated with things like polarity and Vesper theory as well. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, is this discussion today is the beginnings of being able to understand complex molecules like hemoglobin shown to the right. So let's then begin with a quick description of why chemicals form bonds in the first place. Uh, and the name of the game, the thing that determines whether or not we do or do not form bonds, is something known as the octet rule, which we've talked about earlier in the year. The octet rule basically tells us that the most stable electron configurations are the ones where we have either completely filled or one-half filled orbitals. And because those are the most stable, atoms will naturally gain or lose, which creates ionic bonding, or share electrons, which creates covalent bonding, in order to get these configurations. So the driving force then behind why these chemical reactions occur and why these bonds form is when atoms are trying to get more stable configurations. And that's really what drives most chemistry that we're going to see throughout the year. Now, depending on the type of atoms that you're dealing with, that's what's going to determine whether the different types of bonds form. And again, when I say different types of bonds, I mean ionic versus covalent. Um, and really what's going on when you're dealing with ionic versus covalent is it has a lot to do with this concept of electricity, electronegativity that we identified in the previous chapter. The type of bond is based on the properties of the atoms making those bonds, primarily electronegativity. When those electronegativities are similar, we'll get covalent bonding. When those electronegativities are different, we'll get ionic bonding. So let's move then into a discussion as to what a covalent bond actually is. A covalent bond is a link between two atoms, which is what a bond in general is. Uh, but in this case, it's a link that's formed by sharing one or more pairs of electrons between the two atoms. Remember, ionic is when the electrons are exchanged between atoms to complete octets. Here is where we're sharing electrons in order to complete octets. Both atoms have similar electronegativities, and if you guys recall, the electronegativity is the attractive force the atom exerts on bonding electron, and as a result of that, no atom has a strong enough pull on those electrons in order to take the electrons from one another. If they took the electrons, that would form an ionic bond. Since neither of them are strong enough to take from the other, we end up sharing and we get a covalent bond. Covalent bonds are formed between nonmetals and other nonmetals. If you reference back to the shape of our periodic table, all of our nonmetals are located in the top right corner of the periodic table. There's a staircase right here that separates the two sides, so here's where we see our nonmetals. And if you remember from our periodic trends, elements as we go to the right and as we go uh, down or go up on the periodic table have the highest selection negativities. These elements are the furthest to the right and the furthest up, so they all have very high, very similar electronegativities, which is what causes them to form those covalent shared bonds. The goal of a covalent bond is that the octet is achieved by both of the individual atoms completing partially filled orbitals. For example, down below we can take this hydrogen atom. Uh, its first ring can hold a maximum of two electrons, but in this case there's only one of those electrons there. 
hydrogen atoms can naturally then pair with another hydrogen atom so that when looking at them one at a time each hydrogen atom now has the experience of having two electrons in its shell or a completed orbital. This gives both atoms a sense of having an octet and this is what determines why these bonds form and it determines the ratio that the atoms combine in. We wouldn't expect to see more or less hydrogens here because more or less would break the octet once again. Only two hydrogens, the formula H2 is the one that gets us the octet we're looking for. We'll spend more time coming up with chemical formulas later in the chapter when we start talking about something known as Lewis dot structures. They are a simplified way of drawing these configurations that allow us to determine formulas like H2 without having to draw more complex pictures such as these. Now that we've identified what a covalent bond is, is we can start talking about the strength of these covalent bonds. Uh, the first thing we can say about bond strength and covalent bonding is that covalent bonds have different lengths. Uh, we have shorter bonds and we have longer bonds. Uh, bond length is defined as the distance between the two nuclei and that can be shown in the diagram over here to the right. Uh, if we take radius of atom 1 plus the radius of atom 2, those two things combine together to equal our bond length. Bond length chemically then is determined by a couple factors. First of all, the nuclei of the individual atoms are going to be attracted to the electron of the other atom. So this nucleus here is going to attract itself to the electrons of this atom, whereas this nucleus over here is going to attract itself to the electrons of this atom. And that's going to pull these two atoms together. As they start pulling together, however, there are going to become repulsive forces between the electrons of the two atoms. The electron field of this first atom here, which we can denote with some negative charges along the edge, is going to repel against the electron field of the atom over here of their negative charges, and that's going to push these two guys apart. The balance of those two forces, the nuclei pulling in and the electrons pushing out, ultimately settles where the two forces are equal, and the end result is, is whatever that distance is ends up being our bond length. In terms of bond strength, then, what we can say here in the statement down below is kind of the summary of all this. The shorter the bond length is, the stronger the bond. It's a tighter link between the two atoms, and it's a harder bond to break. We can also discuss bond strength in the form of multiple covalent bonds. Each atom can form sometimes a single bond like we've seen before, but in some cases we can form double or even triple bonds. Each one of those individual bonds requires sharing one pair of electrons. And atoms that need more than one more electron to complete their octet can sometimes use multiple bonding like this in order to get that job done. If you recall from earlier, the goal of the bonding process is for all atoms to achieve octets. This is simply another way for that to happen for an atom that needs more than one electron. We've already seen before uh, what a single bond looks like. Here's an example of a single bond between two carbon atoms. They're sharing this pair of electrons between the two of them. But notice that the carbon atom still doesn't have its completed octet. For this carbon atom, that would require eight electrons, and we're still three shy. We would expect this carbon atom to form bonds with other substances or potentially more bonds with the carbon atom that it's already connected to. An example of now a double bond is another molecule we're very familiar with. This is O2, the uh, air, the gas we breathe in order to keep our respiration going in our body. We have this oxygen atom sharing electrons with this oxygen atom, but in this case they're sharing two pairs of electrons to create an oxygen-oxygen double bond. This double bond is what these two atoms need to do in order to complete the octets. Notice that each atom now has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 electrons. And this atom has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 electrons as well. We've achieved that goal, but in this scenario it required sharing two electrons to get the job done. Taking that one step further, we can see the same example with nitrogen. This is the other major gas that creates our atmosphere, N2. And in this case, we're sharing three pairs of electrons to create the nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond. All of these, again, are just different ways for our atoms to achieve the octets that they're looking for. But the end result of these differences is that the more covalent bonds we form, the stronger our bond between the atom is. The nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond is significantly stronger than the oxygen double bond or the carbon-carbon single bond because of those multiple connections between the two atoms.
Let's wrap this up then by talking about some properties that covalent compounds tend to have, and these properties will be in contrast to the properties we discussed about ionic compounds. Uh, covalent compounds tend to have significantly lower melting points. They tend to be significantly softer and more malleable than their ionic counterparts. Uh, most covalent compounds do not conduct electricity uh, when they're by themselves or when they're dissolved in water. Uh, they also generally do not dissolve in water, although there's some exceptions to that. And again, most covalent compounds tend to be flammable. We have a word we use to describe covalent compounds as well, and that word is the word molecules. If you recall, ionic compounds we refer to as salts, covalent compounds we refer to as molecules. Let's talk about some examples. Uh, one example I think that fits all of these categories very, very well is uh, any form of wax. Wax melts at low temperatures. They're very soft and easy to change the shape of. They definitely don't conduct electricity. They definitely don't dissolve in water. And wax is a fuel that we use to fuel fires. Uh, candles, when a candle burns, it's actually the wax that's burning, not the wick itself. We see covalent compounds in the form of liquids as well. Here we got two uh, petroleum products, oil and gasoline, again fitting a lot of our characteristics. These compounds have such low melting points that they're actually liquids at room temperature. Um, they definitely don't conduct electricity and both are very well known for being very, very flammable. Not every covalent compound, however, fits all of these specific properties. Uh, another covalent compound we can discuss is regular old table sugar. Uh, regular old table sugar does have a comparatively low melting point, although significantly higher than some of the substances here. Um, it's not particularly malleable, and table sugar does dissolve in water very, very well. It's still definitely covalent, it just doesn't necessarily match all the properties. That is a reminder that this set of properties is a guideline for what many covalent compounds do, but it's certainly not an exclusive list. We cannot necessarily identify a substance as being ionic or covalent just by looking at properties like this alone, although it's a reasonable guideline. All right, so that brings us to the end of our video for today. Uh, at this point in time, you should be able to again explain what a chem why chemical bonds actually form. Uh, you should be able to describe what a covalent bond is, the specifics of why covalent bonds form as opposed to ionic bonds, and the role that electronegativity plays in that. You should be able to de describe the relative strength of a covalent bond in the form of the lengths of the bond, as well as the type of bond that we're dealing with. And last but not least, uh, you should be able to, or at least be familiar with, the properties that covalent compounds tend to have. The graphic over here to the right is just, again, a comparison between the two. We see an ionic bonding. The key here is an exchange of electrons that creates charge. This atom would now be positively charged, and this would be negative. Those opposite charges are what pull these two atoms towards one another. In covalent bonding, instead of exchanging electrons, we get the sharing of electrons. These atoms are now held together by the fact that to keep sharing the electrons, they have to stay in close proximity, uh, and those electrons are going to hold those two atoms together. So that basically wraps it up for today. Uh, in class, we're going to take our knowledge now of ionic and covalent bonding and use it for some lab work where we're actually going to measure some of these properties and find out how consistent the set of properties we have for ionic versus covalent must really be.